going on everybody welcome to the alex Cuesta show how is everybody doing out there on this wednesday october 11th of 2023 happy to have everyone here listening to episode 94 and david for some reason you still found your way here hey hey i'm good at traveling i can do these things i just watched the one piece live action so i can find myself places even without a map you you, you know listen that's a skill to have but unfortunately we're on Zoom, so you need to find yourself back to where you need to be every, at least every single Wednesday. So you're good there. Um, before we get into all the fun stuff, like, share, follow, subscribe, rate five star Spotify and iTunes. Spread this word of mouth and go find us on the socials. Just go search the Alex Questa show. You'll see us there. And before we jump into this week's show, last week's show, really quickly, I just want to talk about it. We had Tiffany, who is a conservative ex uh, influencer, basically, you know, Twitter, same thing. And we had her on. We talked a lot about, you know, uh, she's a conservative single mother and how they can reach out better and do those types of things. So we had a really great show with her. I want everyone to go out and give that show a listen because it was really good. But this week, I'm super excited for this show, Dave. Um, I got us. I'm not going to lie. When I reached out to this individual, the fact that he got back to me so quickly and was like, yeah, let's do it really pumped me up. He is a good friend of the 45th and going to be 47th president, Donald J. Trump, and one of his advisors. He is Pastor Daryl Scott. What's going on, Pastor Scott? Yeah, everything's good, man. How about yourself? I'm doing well. I'm doing you well. Me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can you hear you. You're skipping a little bit, but yeah. I hear you. Um, I'm really excited to have you on. I'm, you know, I, like I said, I've, you know, listened to you before. I love hearing what you have to say and, you know, everything that you're doing. So I'm really excited for, it. and you're the American first pastor. So that just makes it even better. So I want to jump right in here because uh, obviously right now there is, you know, another major conflict going on in the world, right? We've obviously had Ukraine and Russia going on, but then recently Palestine just attacked Israel. Israel is responding. I just want to start off by asking you, what are your thoughts on the current situation right now with Israel and Palestine? Well, um, I know somewhat of the history of these two countries because um, I uh, look at the Bible as, you know, I'm a pastor and we look at things mm -hmm. in an eschatological standpoint. Mm -hmm. But there's been a lot of revisionist history now regarding the uh, nature of this conflict. Israel had actually begun a movement back to their uh, native land in the late 1800s. That's when it really began to pick up steam mm -hmm. all through the first part of the uh, 20th century. Uh, it was picking up a lot of steam. The world wars interrupted its progress. But initially, the Arab nations were not hostile to Israel uh, coming in and repatriating in that region. You know, Palestine, what they call now Palestine, was historically Israel. You know, I was having a conversation with somebody recently that said, you know, the Israel that's there now was not the Israel of the Bible days. And my reply was, so they moved Jerusalem, huh? <laughs> yeah. It was a 3,000 year old with the nation of Israel. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, and, you know, it. In the, the, after the World War, the Jews, um, were looking for a place to repatriate. They wanted their own national homeland because they had been being persecuted all over Europe. In mm -hmm. fact, all over wherever there were Jewish settlements, there was persecution. Even in America, there was persecution. And they told themselves, in order for us to escape this worldwide persecution, we have to have a homeland of our own, but we want to return to our own native homeland. Mm -hmm. Once again, the Arabs were initially welcoming to that. But then there was a faction that then is now that gave pushback. 1948, uh, well, 1947, the UN passed resolutions by the part of the, um, that region to Israel. The Arabs were receptive to it, a small sliver. May 14th, uh, 1948, Israel declared its statehood. Britain withdrew from it because they had previously been the custodians of their area, mm -hmm. the owners of their territory. The British withdrew. 
left Israel to its own defenses, and they were immediately attacked yeah. by seven Arab nations. You're talking about the Israeli army at that time was only was less than 6,000 men strong mm -hmm. initially. And mm -hmm. there was a country of 600,000 against a combined 40 million. And if you don't mind, my friends, they whooped ass. Yes, you know, did. everyone. Now, here is a myth right now. The myth is that the Arabs are refugees from their own. The Palestinians are refugees. Mm -hmm. That is not the truth. They're not refugees. They're evacuees. There's a difference because the Arab leaders at that time urged the population to evacuate that area, evacuate this Israel, evacuate it because we're going to go in, wipe Israel out, and then you'll be able to move back in. They thought it would take a few days. So they evacuated. They mm -hmm. left the country. They left that region. They left their belongings. They left their homes. They left everything. And the Arabs got their ass whooped. And so now they couldn't come back in because of that. And so watch this. Israel offered. They offered for 100,000 of them to return to their um, homes. The Arab leaders refused. They offered one pound in sterilizations. They refused it. 1956, they came at them again and lost. 1967, they urged the people to desert again, to mm -hmm. evacuate, not, excuse me, not desert, evacuate again. Mm -hmm. And they were, got their butts kicked again. 1973, got their butts kicked. So this notion that the Jews came in and drove them from their land, that's not true. It's not true at all. They evacuated it under the, 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 the notion that the Arab nations would wipe Israel off the map well, the people of Israel exterminate, mm -hmm. annihilate them, and then they would be able to return, and it didn't happen. And so now that narrative has slowly shifted to make Israel the oppressor, and in actuality, Israel has been the one that's been oppressed. And I think the craziest part that maybe a lot of people don't know about the region it's very interesting is, mm -hmm. is that you know Israel isn't just a Jewish nation; they have a lot of no, it's not. Eastern and Arabic people. Mm -hmm that also call Israel home. So when, you know, these other Arab nations attack, specifically using Hamas with the Palestinians, they're not only attacking Jewish people, and the Jewish people have been very friendly to the Arabs that do live in Israel. So it kind of goes to your point that they're not coming in there to force anybody out. The Jews just want to settle somewhere with Jerusalem, with their homeland. And there was for a time uh, West Jerusalem and East Jerusalem, if I'm correct, where the Jordanians owned half of Jerusalem. And then after they attacked, I think it was one of the wars in the 60s that that Israel just dominated Jordan, took most of Jordan, took part of Egypt, took a bunch of places. And then at the end of the war, gave a ton of it back, but said, you know what? Kick rocks. We're keeping our holy land now. We were willing to work with you, but now we're not. And, you know, there's there's a lot to be said about that region overall, right? Because number one, the religious factions have been at war forever, and only basically the Ottoman Empire was able to kind of stave them off for a little bit by using a strong power. But then there is the Western nations kind of carving it up for oil that made that place a, more of a hotbed after World War I with everything like that. But when it comes down to Israel and Palestine, it's just, it's a... Crappy situation, obviously, because you have the, all the hostilities and things being stoked. But the friggin' the Palestinian people, the Arab nations rile them up. Nobody wants them. Israel is told many a times, like they said this time, get out of Gaza. Uh, Egypt closes their border. You know, no one wants <laughs> to get them. So it's like they feign this whole entire, oh, we're behind you, Palestine. But then it's like, okay, sacrifice to the wolves. We're not going to take anyone. So it, it, it's... The history is there and the history has always been, you know, Israel's the original people there. If you're, you know, if you believe the Bible and everything, that was Israeli land. Then when they became, you know, against God's wishes, God exiled them. And yeah. now they're returning. So it's like, and they did return and it was, they were told that they would return to their land. That was promised to them. That's why it is the promised land. And I mean, in the beginning, when they were there, they were willing to be um, amiable to the Arabs and let them use Jerusalem as well. And now you almost can't blame them for being like, no, why would we be nice to you guys? Like, and they've been pretty tame the last 10 years. I'm not going to lie. No, but you're absolutely right. And here's what people don't understand. It's, this is not a dispute over real estate. 
Nope. It's not a geographical dispute, even though it is disguised as mm-hmm. such. Mm-hmm. Um, prior to Israel's entrance into that land, it was just a wilderness desert wasteland. The Jewish people came in and developed that region. They put in irrigation systems to bring water all the way from the Nile River mm-hmm. into that region. They planted thousands of trees. They, they built roads. They built water systems. They built electrical uh, uh, dynamos or whatever, they developed it. It wasn't nothing but a desert prior to that. When you see the movies like Lawrence of Arabia and things like that, it was an undeveloped desert that had nomads and Bedouins and they were living in tents. Yep. So it's, but here's the thing. It's not about real estate. It's about religion. They yeah. cannot mm-hmm. stand a non-Muslim state mm-hmm. in their midst. It's, it's, it's a religious dispute that is disguised as a, ge- as, a, as a geographical dispute. And it's basically the God of the Bible, Jehovah, against the God of Islam, Allah. And, and you know, the goal of Islam, and I said this on CNN, I said it on Alice Anderson Cooper's show five years ago. I said, the goal of Judaism is not to exterminate Islam. But the goal of Islam is to exterminate Judaism. Jews do not mind peaceful coexistence with with, with Muslims. Let's say it that way. Muslims cannot stand peaceful coexistence with non-Muslims. You know, everyone says, well, Islam is a religion of peace. It it never been a religion of peace. Islam means submission. Yes, it means submission, but submission to Allah. Voluntary submission or involuntary submission. That's what it's about. And so they cannot stand the idea of a non-Muslim Jewish state in their midst when their Quran specifically speaks of Jews in a derogatory sense and speaks of the rewards of killing Jews. And so that's what it is. Once again, they want to mask it or disguise it as a as a dispute over territory, but it's not. Because if the Jews were Muslims, they wouldn't have a problem. If, if, if the nation of Israel, the Israelites were Muslims, they wouldn't have a problem with it. No, or they would at least, you know, it w- we wouldn't even notice either, though, because it would be the same as the Kurds, the Shiites, and the Sunnis battling with each other. It would be an in-house religious dispute, and we would kind of turn a blind eye like we do to a lot of other atrocities going on. Watch this. If they had been scattered abroad and in Europe, throughout Europe, mm-hmm. and repatriated to Israel, if all the situations were the same, except they weren't Jewish, mm-hmm. we wouldn't have a problem. No, you're yeah. probably right about that. I, I can't. Yeah, I yeah. can't think I can't dispute that. So in your opinion, what should America do right now? What should our role be in this dispute as it does ramp up? Because right now it's not just the Palestinians. The Lebanese and the Syrians have both got involved firing rockets um, from their territory into Israel, which has been reported again. It's wartime. So I take every report with the grain of salt until it's been you know, confirmed 7,000 times over. But what, in your opinion, what should America do in this situation? Well, I, I look at it not just from a political aspect, but from a biblical uh, viewpoint. The Lord said of Israel to Abraham, I will bless them to bless you. I will curse them to curse you. You know, Britain, Great Britain was the number one power on earth mm-hmm. until they deserted Israel. In 1948, and that's when they began to wane and dissipate to to the point now they're not basically a factor on the world stage. But if I go from a biblical viewpoint, I think America should back Israel. I think there's a great Christian faction here that is pro-Israel. The entire Republican Party, by and large, is for Israel. Um, It would be in America's best interest to back Israel. They're our only ally in the Middle East. Um... But there's going to come to a, a point where I believe America is going to turn its back on Israel mm-hmm. simply because the Bible states that in the last days, God said he would gather all nations will be against Israel. They won't have an ally on the face of the planet. Earth. So ultimately, I see us turning our back on them um, sooner or later. I don't know, but I think we should continue to back them. Now, in terms of backing them, would you be in favor of us getting boots on the ground and supporting them in a ground war? Or, you know, my take is diplomatically back them, sanction the other nations attacking them, provide them humanitarian aid. And I wouldn't mind even if we provided people there to give humanitarian aid, because, you know, that, that I think that's the right thing to do. They're a close ally. But for me personally, unless, you know, if it becomes a, another six country 
going at Israel, you got to start to think they're our closest ally. You got to think of, you know, think that one more through about whether or not we truly go in. But at this point, I'm not in favor of getting boots on the ground because number one, Israel can also handle themselves. They are extremely a good military. Mm -hmm. So, and that's one of the main reasons. But if it comes to a point where Iran is really getting down on them and some of the other more powerful countries in the region, got to be something in consideration to get some special forces in there at least. Now, I, um, I'm like you. To me, boots on the ground is last resort. Yes. I mean, I know a, a friend of mine, a guy that goes to my church, and his unit was just called back. They're going to be deployed on, on the 30th of this month. They're either going to Ukraine or they're – they might wind up going to Israel. Mm -hmm. He was just wanting to retire, and they won't allow him to retire. He's been in Afghanistan. He's been everywhere. He's caught mm -hmm. fire before. And, you know, it's to the point, as far as I'm concerned, boots on the ground is last resort. We can help them in a number of ways. Uh, arming them, sending them arms, sending them aid, I have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. Sending them weapons, no problem. We deployed some aircraft carriers over there, no problem, all of that. But boots on the ground to me is the last resort. I hate to see Americans die on former so, uh, for, foreign so, uh, soil. You know, I grew up in the 60s. I have friends that died in Vietnam. And now we look back and it was like, for what? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That, 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 uh, and I know some guys that went to Vietnam. My, my best friend's brother-in-law went over there. He was exposed to Agent Orange. He went over there one way. Mm -hmm. When he came back, mm -hmm. there was something wrong in his mind. He was there. And well, now we call it PTSD. We didn't know what it was. All we used to say was Winston mm -hmm. came back, and now he's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but he was in those jungles of Vietnam. And, and so, you know, for what, though? That now I know a guy, a friend of mine that was honeymoon. And I'm like, wow, it's like that over there now? It's a honeymoon destination place for Americans, whereas – you know, when I was growing up, Vietnam was a terror, man. Let me tell you yeah. something. I just missed that draft. You know, um, I went into the Army in 1976, but Vietnam, I think we came out of there in 75. Mm -hmm. yep. But prior to that, man, a number of us, we were afraid of that draft. We were like, man, we're going to get 18. They're going to hit us in this draft. We didn't want to go to Vietnam. We didn't want to go over those jungles and die. Mm -hmm. And I see the same thing now. I don't want any Americans having to go over there and fight those savages, man, and potentially get – you know, killed over there for that war. So that's last resort to me. And another big issue to me is I don't trust Biden. I don't trust these no. generals that are currently there to do this properly. And, you know, all wars have become so political because we see them on CNN. We're watching them on Fox News and everywhere. We can see the fights as they're going on with the bombs and everything. And, you know, David, we've talked about this at the dinner table with our dad plenty of times. The generals can't go in and do their job. They have to be politicians. If we just allowed, you know, even these dumbass woke generals, if they're allowed to give strategy and do it properly, I firmly believe if they're just allowed to go do their job without any of the red tape, which is the stuff that hampered Vietnam, right? Because they couldn't do what they want to do because there's a freaking reporter with the camera watching them live film. So they couldn't go in and do what they needed to do to win the war. So and the thing is, too, if we get into Israel, what's the goal? Is America going to participate in Israel with wiping out all the Gaza? I don't know if Americans can stomach that because we're kind of in a situation. We, you know, we just got through 25 years of a war already in the Middle East. And I don't know if you could sit there and sell to Americans. We're going to commit a genocide against the people that, you know, and that's how it will be framed, a genocide against Palestinians. And I don't know if American support is going to get behind that. And, you know, me personally, I don't want our American soldiers going in there and killing a bunch of women and children either. And that's unfortunately what would happen because a terrorist organization, they hide behind them and you almost don't have a yeah. choice. So I, I so that's my three part. I don't trust Biden and the wars are too political. Our generals wouldn't be able to go in and do their jobs at all. Yeah, and are these generals military minded enough to do their jobs? Mm -hmm. I mean, once again, like of, to me, there's a lot of politics these days in war. Mm -hmm. And they are, you know, the generals are, like you said, this woke ideology they're having to participate in and, and a lot of other things outside of the mission itself yes. come into play. And then you have this fact in here at home. Okay, Hamas attacked Israel, brutally slaughtered men, women, and children. Mm -hmm. And you had Americans fighting Americans over it. Whereas there's a number of us that will say, how can you even go out and try to defend that activity? Yeah. Oh, you get yeah. what I'm saying? 
Yeah. To the point that you want to defend that activity, you've got these idiots like Ilian Oman, Rashida Talib, mm -hmm. and these these idiots like them, they're actually trying to either defend it or downplay it. Yep. Even if you agree with the Palestinian cause, to say that this was the right way to go about it, you know, this is the absolute wrong way. They didn't attack soldiers. They attacked civilians outright in front. The goal was to attack civilians. And the irony is those people were at a festival to try and push for a two-state solution. So they attacked people who were for them, which is even more wild and more ironic. And it's like, you can't defend what happened here. If Hamas would have rolled in, told the citizens, listen, scram we're taking this territory anyone that stays we will kill you but you got 24 hours get out that's a completely different scenario where hamas came in they did it the right way and they just we took territory but to sit there and do it the way they did and attack civilians it's not defendable and it's not defendable if anybody does it at all see that's the thing there are surahs in the quran that talk about I me mean, i can dig it up real quick if you want me to that talk about beheading, mm -hmm. putting your neck on the neck of the infidel. Mm -hmm. These are infidels. They have a right, they think. We have a, we have a divine calling to behead them. Mm -hmm. No, Why do you think beheading is the standard form of execution? It's because it's in the Quran to do those type of things and that there's a reward there. And so once again, it's more than just geography. Yep. It's, it's religious ideology. And that's what makes it so difficult to navigate the terrain yeah i feel like that is missing from a, just a lot of people's reaction to it especially on social media i mean if you paid any attention to any of the stuff in the middle east then it's not entirely surprising what hamas did but if you paid no attention or if you just had your head in the sand about it and you don't recognize that hamas especially is running off of religion they're running off of ideology yeah. they're not running off of anything else a lot of people here in America don't run off of something like that. So they have no inkling of what it is to live your life that way. So that's why there's so many people that are so shocked by this. And yeah, obviously it's stomach churning, but it's not exactly shocking what they did. It's not surprising. It's what Hamas is just going to do. Hamas, ISIS. Yeah. It's just an extension of the same ideology. And, and see, here's the reason why the, the media plays such a part in it in America and the Americans respond the way we do. Notice something. Whenever you see Christians portrayed on television, they're fanatics. Yeah. They're nuts. Yep. They're, 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 you know, but whenever you see the Muslim portrayed, mm -hmm. they're peaceful and they're wise mm -hmm. and they just have wisdom coming mm -hmm. forth because the media in America is so afraid to portray Muslims in anything other than a positive light. Yeah. And so as a result, the American public gets the impression of these fanatical Christians, these fanatical Jews, as opposed to these peaceful, peace-loving, wise, knowledgeable Muslims. Mm -hmm. That's the impression that's given. And it's it's a very wrong impression right there. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you know, like you said, they'll go in, they'll slaughter babies. They haven't apologized. No Hamas leader has no apologized. Yeah, no way they're going to apologize. Slaughter no. these babies. Mm -hmm. They have and no one has said, oh, that shouldn't have done. We want to slaughter women and just take off old grandparents. Mm -hmm. and, no, they're not apologizing. Mm -hmm. They're like, yeah, we did it. And we're glad we did it. And when we get a chance, we're going to do mm -hmm. it again. Yeah. And thus we'll do to all mm -hmm. them for those who stand in our way. Yeah, that you know, yeah. that's part of their creed. So if you could sit there and if you were a leader and all of a sudden someone gave you the power to solve this problem, what would you what would be your role or what that's would you try to question. do to solve this? Phew. Well, uh, yeah. I know it's a lot. <laughs> I know I threw it on there and I was like, you know what? Let's see. Let's see what he said. Whenever you have a Jewish and an Arab parties that are in agreement of a two state solution, they always have that revolutionary faction that's not in agreement with yep. from the Arab side. They're like, F that. We ain't having no two state solution. We're getting them infidels out of here. So, it, 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 man, let me tell you something. This is almost an unsolvable problem. Now, looking at it from a biblical standpoint, we look forward to the return of Jesus Christ to straighten mm -hmm. the way. That's what I see coming. You almost have to say, build a wall. <laughs> you almost have to take the Trump solution and build a doggone hundred foot wall, uh, a two hundred foot tall wall, all around Israel. 
<laughs> I'm telling you, uh, and put oil on it, and put glass in the wall, and do it, <laughs> and make it electric or something. I don't know. Just because otherwise, as as possible. <laughs> otherwise, to be quite honest, Palestinians are not going to stop. You know what? They have such a, I don't want to say low regard. I'm going to say they have a regard for their own lives that Westerners don't have. Mm -hmm. To the extent that they will martyr themselves for their cause in mass. You know what I mean? We have mm -hmm. martyr here, martyr there, but not martyrs in mass yeah. where everybody will martyr themselves. Uh, for what they believe to be their cause because they think there's a reward. Mm -hmm. They really believe there's a reward for their martyrdom. And when you look at the living conditions that they have now, as a, I, I'm living like this now, and if I can endure this pain for a minute, I'm chilling in paradise with 72 virgins whose virginity is renewed Every time sexual intercourse, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know that, right? You know that mm -hmm. they're perpetual virgins. Every time you finish, it's see the hymen comes back. And it's again and again and again. <laughs> and when they begin to weigh the alternatives, let me say this one thing before I give you another time. I watched a movie called, um, what's the name of that movie? American. It was a knockoff of American Idol. <laughs> it was a movie. Mandy Moore was in it. Dennis Quinn was in it. What was the name of that movie? American Dreams. Right? Okay. And it was like the American Idol show. It was a movie about it. And so they had an Air, they had an Arabic contestant. One guy got in it. And so the, the Muslim Brotherhood came to him because the winner of the contest got to shake the president's hand. Once you shake the president's hand, push this button, and we'll see you in paradise. And so he said, wow, so y'all going to get blown up too? Oh, they said, oh, no. You're going to go up there now. We'll be up there in 25 or 30 years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, that's how it works, right? They get the people to believe this, but they never do it. So Exactly. All right. So I think your solution is as good as any. So, you know, obviously you're one of uh, Donald Trump's good friends. Um, you're one of his senior advisors and everything going on with his campaign right now. If something like this were to happen under Donald Trump, which I think we're all in agreement, this wouldn't have happened under Donald Trump. But let's say if this did, what do you think his reaction would be? Well, first of all, he wouldn't have waited. He would have swiftly and very bluntly condemned the action and stated his support for Israel. He would have done that right there. And he would have let Israel know that whatever you need America to do, even though he would have been reluctant to do boots on the ground, I know that much, but whatever else you need America to do, we're right here. He would have made a strong statement condemning it condemning anybody else who had that type of mindset that Hamas had. And he would condemn those in America. He would criticize and condemn those in America, especially those in politics that support uh, or who minimize mm -hmm. Hamas's activity. But he would have left no, no, no question about whose side he was on and how he viewed it. And he would have offered unconditional support to Israel. Well, I'm not going to say unconditional. He would have offered a, a lot of support do you think he would have uh, offered something like air support and maybe created a no-fly zone to potentially give Israel, you know, a little bit of an upper hand there without definitely putting boots on the ground, but doing something like, I know no-fly zones are tricky because you're basically putting yourself within that conflict, but I, you know, I feel like it's the best way to not get tanks on the ground, get boots on the ground, but just say, hey, no, I can see that. no one's coming in here. I hadn't thought about that, but you're absolutely right. I think it would have provided air support and sea support. And even a bombing campaign, to help assist Israel in a bombing campaign. I could see him doing that if it warranted that. You know, as like you said, Israel has a very formidable army, so they're able to handle themselves. They should be able to make easy work of Hamas. Yes. Now, once again, if there are other nations like that decide to participate, the, Iran is threatening and... Mm -hmm. um, uh, if anybody else is feeling froggy and want to leap, then I can see America intervening and um, providing them everything once again with um, boots on the ground being the last resort. So where would his mindset be, though, with the fact that because, you know, I thought we were jumping in anyway because Americans were killed. Americans have been taken hostage. So where would his mindset be with that? Because that's usually like the line you don't cross, right? Like we're cool for the most part until you start messing with us and, you know, a German was killed. So it's like, 
where would his mindset be? Would he still be kind of in the, I really don't want to get involved too much? Or would he feel the pressure of, no, Americans were involved. We got to retaliate ourselves. I think he would issue um, issue a directive to Hamas that whatever Americans over there, I'm going to give you X amount of time to, to, to release them, else I'm going to come get them. I think he would feel very, very strongly about Americans being held hostage. Definitely. And once again, he would give them the opportunity to release them. And then um, if they didn't, we have to go to plan B. <laughs> and and they won't like plan B. So why do you think under Donald Trump, things like this didn't happen, right? You know, Russia wasn't even considering going anywhere. You know, uh, Hamas, you know, I think they saw what he did to ISIS and, you know, these terrorist organizations were still doing what they do, but on a much less scale. So why do you think this stuff didn't happen under Donald Trump? Well, I think that what people consider to be a detriment can very oftentimes be a compliment. One of the reasons the Democrats said don't elect Trump was because of his unpredictability. They said he's too unpredictable. But that can work as a plus, Mm -hmm. you know, and the perception of others. Because of his unpredictability, people don't want to mess with him. Mm-hmm. They don't want to cross that line. They don't want to, they don't want to take the risk of, uh, of it. And so I think that because of the – and to be quite honest, I think Donald Trump is being – he's not being given the credit for being the statesman that he is. He was solid. You know, he's being criticized for being a statesman, but he said, why should we have hostile, antagonistic relationships with, company, with countries that we have to deal with? Yep. Mm-hmm. And so rather than stay under the threat of North Korea nuking South Korea, we can reach out and at least have some dialogue. We he can have some dialogue the with DMZ Russia. Alone. He walked across <laughs> alone with no security detail. What other president has the balls to put themselves in a hostile nation? They, North Korea could have very easily killed him, laughed and paraded his corpse around and, you know, easily could have done that. But he had, you know, the size of Kohongas on that man is incredible yeah. to do that yeah and and once again he established a line of communication and mutual respect yep. with vladimir putin with president g in china so he could call them because he developed a relationship and ease tension without it even having to make the news yeah but yeah. now you know so I, I i believe because of that his influence hovered over that Hovered over that region. You know, he he had the the the, the hood spot and the moxie to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Yep. Uh, despite who didn't like it, but uh, but you didn't see any repercussions or consequences mm-hmm. of that. Nope. Because once again, the figure, the specter of Donald Trump looms large on the world stage. And now in this administration, we don't even have an ambassador there. There is no ambassador currently in Jerusalem, which is you know ridiculous. And you know people forget. You talked about Vladimir Putin. Everyone loves the leftists love to talk about like when he was saying kind things. They forget that when he quite literally said, if you mess with anything, I will destroy Moscow. He flat out told Vladimir Putin, I will destroy Moscow if you miss that. Yeah. And like, so it's like as much as, you know, he's definitely plays by the keep your enemies closer, right? Like that is kind of his deal, but let them know what's up at the same exact time. And that's what, like you said, he does not get the credit. For doing those things, no, he doesn't. the Abraham Accords, which arguably is one of the greatest things any Western power has done in the Middle East, especially since it got all carved up. So, yeah, no, he definitely does not get the credit he deserves there. You're absolutely right, man. And, um, you know, if we in America, if a majority of Americans, Democrat and Republican, look at Joe Biden as a doddering, dumb old, demented um Alzheimer, dementia-laden, ancient, old, mold, and mildew, arthritis, rheumatism, uh, daughter and old uh, uh, geezer, how do you think they look at him outside of America? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, wasn't it, who, I forget who it was, wasn't it Putin or one of the Chinese uh, people that said they hope Joe Biden gets in because he's a moron? Like, I'm pretty sure it was clear. I think it might have been the Russians that were like, we hope this guy eventually becomes president. He's a moron. We'll take advantage of him. And we've always known Joe Biden was a moron. He was, listen, 
He was a much better politician in his youth because he was a decent speaker and things like that, but he was never smart. And he was always a racist piece of garbage. So it's like, it's surprising, like not surprising because people just love to just see the media and the leftists just say what they want to say. But the rest of the world knew who Joe Biden was. They've always known who he was and they were licking their chops. And now China's definitely going to take Taiwan and Biden's not going to do a damn thing about it. And the people of Hong Kong and the people of Taiwan are going to be subjugated under, you know, red China's boot. And it's, it's awful. It's awful because this guy is just, no one's scared of him. Speaking no, he's not. He's, a, he's allowing Ukraine to pimp him out. Mm-hmm. We didn't even go. That's a whole nother story. He's getting pimped out by Ukraine. Yep. And so, uh, and he, he, he just appears to be so, he's not even indecisive. He's non-decisive. <laughs> the conflict started with Israel and, pa- and Palestine, the Palestinians in Israel, at like 7.30, 8 o'clock p.m. He didn't hear about it until 7 in the morning, 7.30 in the morning, which means he was asleep and nobody woke up the president of the United States to tell them that there was a wor- major world conflict. It is prime time. Get out there by 9 o'clock and, t- and say something, which we know Donald Trump would have tweeted about it and then would have been out there at 9 o'clock making a speech. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the only thing I like about Joe Biden is the way he trains dogs. Because <laughs> Major and Commander ain't no joke. And I'm sorry, <laughs> I've got a German Shepherd. There you go, right there. I got a German Shepherd, Yogi. And I wish he had a little more Commander in him, even though in the area I live, he has to be um, socialized. <laughs> and I had a German Shepherd before that was like Commander. And the city I lived in, took him from me and euthanized him. Oh, no. He used to get loose all the time. He was up and down the neighborhood killing all the neighbor's dogs, man. (laughs) He was killing dogs and hospitalizing them and crippling them. And I don't know how this guy kept getting loose. I had had three electric shock collars on his neck and everything else. (laughs) He was on a mission. One day I hid. One day I hid. Because I said, how's he getting loose? Mm -hmm. He backed up. And ran through the do- ran through the collar, and he said, "Hey!" And ran through, and then he went up and down the street and everything. And by the time I come home, he would come back home, me- beat me back home. But I like I like mean dogs. So Commander and Major Commander bit Major bit eight people. Commander has bitten eleven. <laughs> so, and I love when they send them back for retraining in Biden. Delaware. They go, they go, well, they like, go send them back for retraining in Delaware. They come back, they bite someone else. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what though, Pastor Scott, I can't wait to read all the gushing stories from, you know, retired secret service about how great and courteous and amazing Jill and Joe Biden were and how they just love their dogs. Cause you know, those are going to come soon. They, they, oh, you, yeah. It's mandatory right now. If you work in the secret service, you have to write a gushing book or something about a Democrat president when they leave. Like, it ju- it's just how it is. So we yeah. talked about Joe Biden. I want to jump, you know, last topic I want to talk to you about is a presidential election coming up in 2024. Um, obviously, Donald Trump is way ahead in the Republicans. And on every poll that we have seen lately coming out of big, uh, big states, Donald Trump has been ahead of Biden in a lot of polls and not just, you know, your Gallup poll, your Rasmussen, the ones you expect, but in your Ipsos polls, in your ABC polls, in a lot of the polls that do not want to see Donald Trump leading ever. So um, right now, as you talk to Donald Trump, as you give him some strategy and advice, what is his current strategy and um, that he's looking to win the presidency back and next time? Yeah, well, first of all, right now, and this is something that uh, my business partner said to me on election night. We were at the White House on election night. And when we left, and after it came through and they were saying Biden won, he said, well, now we get to play offense for the next four years. He said the defense has been on the, been on the, on the field too long, mm-hmm. and you get tired. You know, mm-hmm. Trump was playing defense from the time he first entered the Republican primary yep. in 2015. Yep. So from 2015 to 2021, he was playing defense. He's still playing some measure of defense now, but he now he's able to play offense. He's able to look at Joe Biden's ineptitude, and it gives him a whole nother mm-hmm. um stream to comment on a whole nother stream is look at this administration look and compare it to mine we can contrast a lot of different things in the biden administration to the trump administration to the extent that 
We're looking back. Biden's been in office since January 2021. We're looking at 26, well, 2017 to 2021. Right now, we're looking at that as kind of a, a golden era. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at that as the good old days. Mm-hmm. And it's only a few years ago. Oh, man, I remember the good old days when gas was only a dollar eighty five cents. Yep. The good old days <laughs> and the interest rate. The interest rate was three point. Like I'll give an example on my building that my church is in. I had an adjustable rate mortgage. Mm-hmm. When Trump was in, I was paying one, two percent. Now I'm up to because I have to I'm paying a point or two over prime. I'm up to I went from three percent to ten percent. Jeez. In a couple of years. Yeah, think about it. And so, you know, we look back on the Trump days as the good old days. And it was only like yesterday. And so because of that, a lot of Americans, spoken and unspoken, loud and quiet, Democrat and Republican, are yearning for the days of Trump. And there's a lot of folks that I believe are saying, I'm going to vote for Trump. I'm just not telling anybody. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. So here's my thing. Since you have Donald Trump's ear. First thing I would love for you to tell him, if he ends up debating Joe Biden again, tell him just to let Joe Biden talk. Because I think one of the things that Donald Trump did, and I know he, you know, he can't help it. He loves to, you know, tell someone when they're being stupid. That's Donald Trump's thing. He's very big. But man, if you just let Joe Biden talk, he'll bury himself. Because especially when it's on the fly, the man don't know nothing. So that would be, you know. And I know Donald Trump don't listen to no one, really. He just, you know, Donald, you know, President Trump does President Trump. But let him talk. And man, hammer the Abraham Accords now. Hammer the Uh, Abraham Accords now, definitely. But you know what? I'm going to be honest, and I I say this very humbly. He's listened to me a couple of times when I've had the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I've been there when other people were afraid to speak to. I'll give an example. We were on on Air Force One Mm -hmm. going to... Um, down south, I think it was South Carolina, and they and and it was right when Lewis died, John Lewis died, yep. Yep. and we were on Air Force One, and they came in and announced John Lewis died, mm-hmm. and they said, "Well, uh, w- w- we think you should give a speech about John Lewis." And they wrote this speech out. And Trump had it and said, well, "Let me ask you guys, what do you think about this speech?" And while everybody's sitting there, yeah, yeah, I said, "Man, hell no!" <laughs> I, I actually took the speech out of his hand. I said, man, John Lewis hated you. Yeah. You don't go up there. Don't, 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 don't land there and try to eulogize this guy. I actually took the speech out of his hand and said, somebody give me a magic marker. They gave me a Sharpie. And I drew lines through 90% of it and said, just get up there. I'm sad to hear John Lewis die and let it go with that. Mm-hmm. Don't get up there. I said, if you get up there trying to eulogize this guy, they would, you'll be damned if you do. Because they would tear you apart. How dare you utilize, I yeah. utilize, I eulogize, I great John Lewis. I said, man, don't do it. And he listened to me. He didn't do it. And it didn't make any news. He went, John Lewis died. Sorry to hear that. I just mm-hmm. keep it moving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I've had a couple of other, but you know, yeah, I had the, I had the luxury of with him being my friend with the fact that I didn't work there. So I didn't have to be afraid of job security. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that does help, right? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have to be afraid of repercussions if I said something that he, he didn't really like. Or I didn't have to have a fear in me that I want to say this, but if I do, now somebody, you know, I didn't have that. I didn't have that. And really, to be honest, I got away with a lot of stuff because there was nobody they could tell on me to other than him. And because of my personality, he likes that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So he was like, wait, my enabler. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my enabler? Bring it. Let me, get, like, let me get that second opinion so I can go do it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, but, um, you know, I, I think we have a great relationship and I, I think I understand him pretty much. And with him being a New Yorker and being a straight shooter, mm-hmm. look, man, just shoot back straight with him. If he likes yeah. it, he likes it. If he don't, he don't. But a lot of people just to be around him. I think they were a little bit intimidated of him and mm-hmm. afraid to do that. But, you know, at my age, heck, I'm 64 years old. What I got to be afraid of? I'm self-employed, <laughs> 64 years old. Exactly. I, don't, I don't work at the White House, and I never wanted a job up there. And yeah. so, you know, um, I, I, I think I didn't have some of the hesitation that some of these other people had. Yeah, I mean, my, my best. I mean, and I will tell him that, man. Just let that, let that fool talk. Let, let him talk. Heck. Let, let him, him talk. talk. Let him bury himself and... Man, just I know the election was a big deal, and I know we're still fighting. It, and I, you know, I believe that you know Trump did, 
did fucking fantastic. Sorry, part of my French, but did his job, won three million more votes than he did the other time. And there's no reason why he shouldn't have won. No incumbent does that and loses, right? So honestly, it's just this time, not necessarily let it go, but don't harp on it. Slam his record. He has a great record, foreign, economic, all this stuff. Slam his record and just continue to do that and only do that. And that would be and that would be the biggest way that I would do. And when you know, yeah. the biggest the biggest criticism I see on the right, and you probably see it on Twitter too, is the way he handled COVID and the vaccine, right? They love to grill him on the vaccine. And I've said it on the show before, and all Donald Trump's gotta say is listen, warp speed worked. We got that vaccine out as quick as we we could. Now, did the vaccine work the way the pharmaceuticals told me it would? No. But I'm not going to apologize for doing everything that I thought we needed to do for the American people. And that's it. Claim it. You know what did. But you know what? He doesn't have to back the vaccine because I think that's the biggest knock. And a lot of people get turned off at the way he backs the vaccine. Because you know what? If he doesn't back it, then he has to admit to him to a mistake. And he ain't doing that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And he doesn't. The thing is, he doesn't necessarily have to admit to it. He could even admit. He could admit just telling me was to say I was lied to because he was. But he was lied. But but you know what else though? The one thing he did not do, he didn't mandate vaccine. No, he didn't mandate. And so because of that, I mean, in his mind, he took the vax and it worked for him. Mm Yep. You understand? And Mm -hmm. there's a lot of activity. But I look. But I have family members that did, Mm -hmm. and it was just you know they took it with no side effects and no after effects. Mm-hmm. I didn't take it with no side effects after effects. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I didn't take it simply because I'm adver- I'm adverse to needles. I just don't like taking shots or nothing. I, my <laughs> wife had to make me get flu shots, you, you know. But um, but Trump took the vaccine. He took it, and he doesn't see anything wrong with it because he took it, and it, yeah, he didn't have any negative side effects. And so, uh, but one thing about it, he didn't mandate them, and and so. Um, as a result, if he had never c- tried to develop a vaccine, he would have been criticized for that. Think oh, about absolutely. it. And when COVID, mm-hmm. COVID came, nobody knew what to do. Mm-hmm. Nobody knew. knew It was something it's something that came out the blue and we dealt with it just like any other emergency. And you look back now, it's a couple of years later, and say, well, maybe we should have did this differently or did that differently. But it was a learning experience. And, you know, and I like what you said there, the fact that it's another thing he should really hammer away. I didn't mandate masks. I didn't mandate vaccines. I recommend it at times. Maybe you should do this, you know, if you want to. And really hammer that away that I gave people the choice. Now, if governors wanted to do what they wanted to do, I was letting the governors decide and supporting the governors as much as they needed, which is exactly what he did. So that that's another thing that you said that would be great that he, you know, Hammer those things away. Hammer all the positives because there was a absolute ton of positives to at least the first three years and COVID really derailed things. And, you know, the thing is, too, in Donald Trump's events, I don't know a president that survives COVID. You know, uh, you know, honestly, that is such a tough thing because the economy did get hurt. When the economy gets hurt, usually presidents move out. So it's a really tough thing. And he did, I think, the best he could. But. You know, it, it's it was tough, but he needs but to you know what else? three years, how good he did. Watch this, though. I think a lot of it was overblown. Oh, yeah. I think that, you know, once COVID came in, all of a sudden flu deaths vanished. Mm-hmm. Nobody even caught a cold anymore. I think the media hyped it and overblew it. And no, yeah. I said it. I said it a number of times while he was president. And I reiterate it now. They wanted Donald Trump out of office so bad. And they said, we ought to destroy this whole country in order for him to get him out of office. We will. And COVID, I think a lot of it, when he said it was a hoax, I think a lot of it was. I don't think it was as bad or as infectious and contagious. I don't think as many Americans were impacted by it as they reported. You know, you used to look on television on cnn and they had a running meter yeah. until joe yeah, biden got elected until joe biden got elected then they took it but off now, like nobody's COVID not on a COVID anymore no no like COVID, COVID stopped when joe biden got elected even though people right. were dying from it but you know and it was overblown because if you didn't have a comorbidity and if you weren't old you basically weren't dying you were getting really sick and you felt like crap and then you would recover I got it. I got it at least twice. David got it like 19 times but That's um <laughs> but you but know i had it I think I caught it 
before they knew what it was. Because all I know is one day I caught something back in, I think it was 2019, before COVID was announced. And it was like a real, 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 real bad cold. Mm -hmm. And I was sicker than I had ever been sick in my life. Yep. But I didn't know what it was. And just, man, I don't know what it was. And it was two days, it was, it, was it, it, it broke. You know, and I look back on it and say it was probably COVID. And so I'm not saying COVID was non-existent. I just don't think the mortality rate was what it what they said it was. I think it was I, I really like, don't. And once again, like you said, once, once Biden came, yeah, once Biden came in, it vanished. Now think about it. They're trying to start that crap back up with the election. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah, they're they trying to start it back up so they can go back to the Nailing. ballot harvesting yeah. and the mail-in ballots and month-long voting and all that. Because to me. That's where I always thought the fraud was mm -hmm. on the mail in balloting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and regardless, just the fact that they're able to go door to door and collect ballots from people, you're telling me they're not telling them who to vote for. Like it, it was real easy to do. But so last thing I want to ask you before we jump out of here, obviously, Joe Biden doesn't scare anybody. But if something happens to Joe Biden and they decide that Kamala is the moron that she is and they don't want her and they get someone else. Is there anybody like a Gavin Newsom or like a Michelle Obama that, you know, maybe uh, you have to re-strategize for and maybe gives you a little more competition than Joe Biden would that you guys would have to not necessarily be scared of them because I think Trump's not scared of anybody, but, you know, have to really look and say, hey, this is a race, more of a race now than it was. If they decide to eliminate Joe Biden, I think their best shot would be to go to try to re-woo Robert Kennedy. Back to the Dems. I don't see, I don't, I don't see win. anybody that they have in Senate. I don't see any <laughs> congressman they have. They're not about to run another black dude up there. So Cory Booker, or one of them yeah. guys, can forget it. Mm -hmm. They're not going to do them. Uh, Hillary, nah, they're not going to go get her again. I don't see any other Democrat woman that that would do it. Uh, that they could get it. They could try to go get Michelle Obama, but she'll get her butt kicked. Uh, I don't think that I don't think that I don't think she would win. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, th there are a lot of men, black and white, that just ain't going to vote for a woman. And that's just all it is to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're not wrong. So, uh, David, you have your last question of the show. Yes, actually, it changed up from what I told you it'd be. I oh, usually okay. do a non sequitur with our guest that has nothing to do with any of the topics that we talked about. I forgot last week with Tiffany because I wasn't feeling great. But. I changed it up because I did see what you're wearing. So I have to ask, comic book wise, who is your favorite hero, either Marvel or DC? You can give me both. Doesn't matter. I'm, first of all, I'm leaning. I, I got to go with Marvel. Okay. Simply because in the 60s, when I was growing up reading comic books in the 70s, DC's comics were mostly whack. Marvel, Stan Lee was just a literary genius. I think Stan Lee's genius. Uh, 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 literary genius is understated uh, in America. Favorite Marvel character? Probably Thor. Ooh. Yeah, it's a good one. It's awesome. Yeah. I probably you don't hear Thor, Thor as much. You hear yeah. people like Thor, but you don't hear favorite. Why is Thor your favorite? Man, Thor was a G, man. <laughs> I, I like Thor. I like I like I like the I like the storylines. Mm -hmm. His storylines were, were very, very good. Just the whole Earth Asgard mm -hmm. uh, storyline, you know, and they introduced a lot of character. Loki was a was a good villain. Yep. They even had Hercules and Thor yep. battling, and Odin would strip him of his powers and all of that. Um, I've got. Let me see. I've got. I've got. Journey in the Mystery is when uh, Thor first appeared. I've got a whole lot of them. I've got Spider Man, sixty Spider Man number two, all the way up to number. 200 fantastic oh, awesome. four number two all the way up to 200 i've got the avengers number two all the way up to 200 i've got Incredible. the hulk i've got iron man i've got captain america i've got the x-men i've got everything i like the fantastic four the fantastic four was great the comics played it better than the movies mm -hmm. um so i think i'd go with thor first fantastic four second that's awesome. You know, Pastor, we're going to have to have you on again one time just to geek out. Yeah, <laughs> like seriously. We're going to have to do a whole entire comic awesome. book one. Yeah. yeah. Hey, man. And you know what else? I still read them. I go that's get awesome. them. My wife will look up and I'll bring them all upstairs. And my wife, and you know, 
I got them bagged and bought it. Yep. But I'll get them out. You know, touch them things. Don't put your hands on them. They're worth some because I've got some. Like I've got a couple of when the Black Panther was first introduced. Yep. I've got that. That's uh, fantastic. Point number fifty-two. Mm-hmm. Um, the Galactus narrated when the Galactus was introduced. That was probably the greatest. But you know what I like the best when I watch the movies. And I know the storyline from the comic books. Yep. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Even though That's they what screwed, I like a lot. They yeah. screwed up Civil War and the Infinity Gauntlet one because they were yeah. both so much better in uh, the comic form. Listen, we have to hook you up with. Have you ever heard of the Geeks and Gamer guys and uh, or Nerd Nerd Rodic more? Nah. Y'all got, see, my wife is a gamer. I'm the geek. She the gamer. <laughs> you need to be hooked up with that crew because they do like live YouTube shows where they talk. They're a bunch of, you know, they're freedom loving, most of them right leaning conservatives, but they talk about all the geek stuff. And one of them does um, the real BBC, which is all yeah. board, bag boarding, boarding and bag and boarding as and they're stuff. chatting and stuff. Mm-hmm. So we need to hook you up with those dudes because I feel like number one, they would love you. And number two, you can geek out with them and you'd enjoy it. You know who I heard was a comic book geek? Who? Oh. Bill o- Bill O'Reilly. Hey, I'm a Maris grad, and so is he. So we have that connection. I had no idea. About that. <laughs> I didn't know that either. <laughs> Let me ask y'all: Do y'all know any tips that can help in the latest Assassin's Creed? Because my wife, <laughs> my wife is an Assassin's Creed. She been playing that thing, and the new one came out. Talking about uh, Mirage. She went on it. Is that what the name of it? I think it's is? Mirage. I, don't play that. I haven't. I, I haven't followed Mike Assassin's Creed. Creed. I haven't okay. gamed in years. My PlayStation 4 is sitting in my closet. I have not gamed in years. I have a whole computer for gaming. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's been good. We got to do this again, man. Yeah, 100%. We do. So once again, that is Pastor Daryl Scott. He is a close friend and advisor to Donald Trump. Um, we did have some connection issues tonight, so I'm going to chop it up and you hopefully... We will do, I'm going to have fun adding this one, but we will do this again soon. Yes. Um, I really appreciate you coming on. So if everyone liked what they heard, like, share, follow, subscribe, rate, five star, Spotify, and iTunes, spread this word of mouth, go ahead and find us on the socials at the Alex Cuesta show. Um, Pastor Scott, anything you want to shout out um, that you want to talk about? No, man, I'm good. I appreciate you guys having me on. I'm appreciate looking forward you. to coming back again. I, I, you notice at first I, I ran and jumped into the one thing that I was they put my t-shirt back on to just relax and chill with you guys. <laughs> and it's been great. It's been great. I love it. I do want to give you a shout out though, because you have your TV show, SmackDown with Daryl Scott on Real America's Voice Television Network. So I need to talk about that. Because the people need to know about your show where they can find you and hear all your awesome takes. You want to hear how I got that show? How'd you get that show? The owner of the network and uh, they contacted me and said we have a new network coming on, Real America's Voice. Mm-hmm. And we went to President Donald Trump to ask him, because the number of them were Trump supporters, yeah. if he would agree to come on our network sometime. And he said, I'll do it under one condition. They said, what? You give my friend Daryl Scott a show. That's, that's how awesome. I got it. That's us. <laughs> and that's why Donald talk, Trump's a G, honestly. <laughs> yeah, he's a G. And now here's the thing. So they, they had me come up to Washington, D.C. to talk with the owners about it. And I told him, I said, man, listen. I do not delude myself into thinking that all of a sudden I'm the newscaster yeah. and I'm, I'm a newscaster. Like, you know, I'm, I'm on the level of Hannity mm-hmm. and, and Tucker and uh, uh-uh. and see, I knew too many of my friends that were part of the Trump campaign that even some guys I bought in, they did a couple hits and all of a sudden they thought they were, seasoned veteran i would look on their twitter pages and they would say stuff like as seen on cnn and msnbc <laughs> and Fox. i never deluded myself into thinking i was one of them so i told him i said man i tell you what i'm not getting on there doing no news show mm-hmm. but if you just want let me get on there and talk crap then i'll do it so they said okay so then we think of a name and it, 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 it would have been crap crap talk <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, well, man, if I can get on there and talk smack, I'll do it. And they said, okay. And that's how the name came up, that's SmackDown. Awesome. Yeah, that's because awesome. I said, man, if you just let me get on there and freelance, it's totally unscripted, freelance, and just talk smack and talk crap. And the one thing is, I think I'm equally fair on both sides because I throw the let the right under the bus just as quick mm-hmm. as I throw the left under the bus. Yeah. Hundred percent. And listen, yeah. there's a lot of people on quote unquote the right that I don't even think they're on the right, but they're doing some dumb stuff. Like right now, putting in Steve Scalise as the you know guy that they want to see as a speaker. Uh, you know, we can get into all yeah, that. They could have left for hours. If they're gonna do that, they might as well have left McCarthy in there. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and they I mean, put Steve Scalise in there. They might as well left McCarthy. I don't know if you know about the Liberty score that conservative review does, but I posted it up. Steve Scalise has a 56% conservative score. Basically that he votes 56% of the times with freedom, with conservatism, uh, with the constitution. Jim Jordan, the other option was at 94%. And that's the guy that they didn't want. So we'll see. Hopefully Matt Gates can do what he does and they can vote against him and we can force them to get someone real. They know that Jim Jordan is close to Trump. Yep. That's the reason why you have that faction that does not want Trump to be able to exercise what they perceive to be influence over the speaker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but... You know, I digress there. We can go on a whole other show, but we do have to jump out of here. I don't want to go forever. Um, we can talk forever, but yeah. we're not Joe Rogan yet. When we get to Joe Rogan, we'll do six hour podcasts. But I everyone, know that's right. Thanks so much for listening. We appreciate it. We'll be back next week. So long, all.